Is y'all keeping the fire burning? Drop Nation. You feel it burning as we dig on that orientation, man, as we stare into a whole new world. Hey, hi to Sister Sonia Aqua. Hey, hi. Because that dropped right there, man. That, that lit a spark in me, man. That lit a spark in us. That got that fire burning again. Because we've been searching, we've been searching, man. We've been searching. And this is so great, you know what I mean, to find a gym, you know what I mean? Because it don't have to come through me. It has to come through you, you know what I'm saying? We find them gyms together. We find them gyms together. Hold up, man. Let me adjust my fireplace a little bit, man. Let me get my little poke stick. Sometimes that fire need to be adjusted so that we can keep the fire burning. Okay, let me get that right. Let me, all right, okay, okay. All right, we good then. We good. Drop Nation, where you at? Shabbat Shalom. Allow a to the home team. Say it with me. Drakan Kwan. Allow a We keep the fire burning. We keep the water flowing. Pray you're doing great and you're really enjoying that orientation drop. That truly is a gift. You know, I mean, why is it so important, drop? You know, why is your orientation important? Because, yo, if you don't know which way you're going, if you don't even know that there is a way, that there is a path, that there are more worlds beyond the pole, how could you ever, I mean, how could you ever have any perspective at all on an exodus? How could you have any perspective on an exodus if you have no idea about your earth plane? You have no idea about your terrain. I mean, the first thing a, a battle-ready general, you know what I mean, gets together is orientation. When it comes to that battle, you better know your terrain. Art of war. So if they keep you without knowing your terrain, man, that's art of war one-on-one. They run in circles around you while you spinning on a ball. They run in circles around us while they got us spinning on a ball in our brains and our minds and the inception. Let's go. I am a wah who brought you out of Egypt. Out the house, the house of bondage. Where's Egypt, man? Is this is this whole earth pawn Egypt? I mean, what's really going on? Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto you a graven image, nor any manner of likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, and that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down unto them, nor serve them, for I am Hawa, your power. I am a jealous power, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. <laughs> this ain't no turn the other cheek frequency, Jack. This is your ancient love song. And showing mercy unto the thousands generation of them that love me. And what? Keep my commandments. Here's the code. These are the rules. Thou shalt not take the name of Hawa in vain. Or do not swear falsely, as some translations say. Do not swear falsely by the name of Hawa. Do not say, oh, Hawa told me that this is what we need to do. <laughs> oh, Hawa said we should do that. That's bearing, you know, false witness and taking the name of Hawa in vain, swearing falsely by the name of Hawa, for Hawa will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Remember the Shabbat to keep it holy. Six days you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Shabbat unto Hawa, your power, and in it thou shalt do no manner of work. Thou 
nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, maidservant, cattle, stranger within your gates. For in six days, Hawaii made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and the seventh day. Wherefore, Hawaii blessed the Shabbat and hallowed it. Hawaii rested on the seventh day. The seventh letter of the Hebrew, Paleo Picto, is the Zion. Zion, that's the seventh day, the seventh letter. The Zion means to rest. It means to weaponize, weapon, rest, nourishment, food, cut off. So get your food, man, so you can cut off all that static. Honor your father, your mother, that your days be long, a while, upon the land which a while your power gives you. Upon the what? Upon the land. We ain't crazy for looking into more land, more worlds beyond a pole. Shout out to Aqua Sonia, 1972. Flat Earth Secret Work Shield U.S. Archives. This is another world, people. Another world, people. Another Earth pump. Let's go. So when we talk land, you have a perspective, right? Let's go. Honor your father and your mother, your frame and your shaper, that your days be long upon the land which Hawa, your power, gives you. How much land does Hawa give us? You know what I mean? Did Hawa give us this land too? How many arpons do we got? <laughs> How many are there? Does every tribe got an earth pond? <laughs> Let's go, man. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor, thou shalt not cover your neighbor's house, nor shall you cover, shall not cover your neighbor's wife, nor manservant, nor maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, his donkey, nor anything that is his name, your neighbor's man, don't, don't covet none of your brother's stuff, let them have what they got, be proud of them, don't be jealous, don't be no hater. Don't we got this in the hood today? A bunch of haters and shit. You know what I mean? But it's not just that people just want to hate. It's just that, you know, it's a product of being without, man. But even back then, we had haters, man. People covered in your wife. Oh, man, he got a beautiful wife. Oh, he got a beautiful house. Oh, man, he, he got uh, strong servants. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, man, look at his donkey. I wish I had his donkey. Don't be like that. Be grateful. Have gratitude. And all the people perceive the thunderings. <laughs> thunderings, huh? Lightnings, huh? We're just talking about that mesosphere. Dragons in the mesosphere. And the voice of the horn. What kind of horn? I mean, digging on all this dragon drop. That's all I see now. Thundering. Lightning, <laughs> horns, <laughs> and the mountain smoking. <laughs> uh, I don't want to go crazy here, but it looks like we have some dragon energy popping off. And when people saw it, they trembled. Yeah, you got some serious dragon energy popping off. And they stood far off. Now you can see why they stood so far away. Before you're like, why are they afraid of Most High? Why are they afraid of Most High? <laughs> Yeah, man. Because <laughs> it's all happening. That's why. So they say, yeah, let me back up. Let me back up. And then Moses, they said to Moses, speak thou with us and we'll hear. It. But let not Hawa speak with us lest we die. <laughs> That's how serious that energy is, man. So, yeah, we just surfing away because this is. You know, the Ten Commandments, or as we know, nine, as we know, the first and the second are the same one. And they just kind of, in the Catholic Church or whatever, split them into two to get you out that nine frequency, that four plus three plus two is nine. I am Hawa, your power, who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods. Thou shalt not make graven images or any likeness. Thou shalt not bow down to them. All this is talking about the same transgression. Then you go into killing and stealing and 
you know, coveting and those are completely different things. But the question is, when we talk Moses Mamanides, go get that drop, go get parts one and two so you know who we're talking about. Moses Mamanides, who wrote this Sefer Hamid's Woe, they say in uh, 1168. Then Anand ben David, who wrote the Sefer Hamid's Woe in 770, that's a 400 year gap. Now, did Moses Mamanides just expound on these 10 commandments, 9 commandments, or are we talking about we only got a shell of what it really, you know, pertained to in detail? Because you can't just say don't have no uh, no idols and, you know, some folks might be um, confused. <laughs> Which idols are you talking about? That's when you go into the Sefer Hamid's yeah, Woe about the throwing of the stones, right? Don't be throwing those stones. Sefer Hamid's Wall. Now again, it's documented that this was written by two different people. Or the same people. And 400 years different. Anand ben David in 770. And Moses Mamanides, son of, son of Maimon. Alright. Go get those drops, part one and two. We just got to keep it going full. Also known as Ram Bomb. And I say, what's this got to do with Amram? Like Moses, son of Amram, right? Come on, man. You got an Amram and a Ram Bomb? You got an Amram and a Ram Bomb? And you're not telling me that these are fantasies and duplications? Will the real Moshe please stand up? You know, we're just talking a non Ben David. The last time we left off on negative commandment. Remember, the positive command is negative. It just means here's what you should do. Here's what you should avoid doing. Here's what you should not do. Here's what you should do. If you notice, again, the 248 positive and 365 negative add up to 613, uh, right? So that's 6 plus 3 plus 1. That's back to 10 commandments. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, this is high level, you know what I mean, foolery when it comes to the Dualities, 10 commandments or 613? 10 commandments or 613? Did Moses just come out, come down with a, a tablet of just 10 commandments written out? Or did he come down with them uh, 316, you know what I mean? 248 positive, 365 so-called negative, which is just telling you thou shalt not do this and that, such as thou shalt not throw stones, right? Let's see where we left off. And even when you look at uh, Exodus 20 here, think of them now in terms of positive and negative. All right, so this is something I've never done, uh, but let's do it together. It's all about having a, you know, 360 perspective. So why is there, you know, 248 positive and 300, you know what I'm saying? Why is there more negative or thou shalt not? And try to think about that ratio as we look at these so-called 10 or 9 transgressions. You know what I'm saying? How many are so-called positive and negative? All right. So, I am Hawa. All right. You shall not. You shall have no other gods before. Me. That's telling you what not to do. Right. So, that's a negative commandment. All right. Thou shalt not make <clears throat> make any graven images. Obviously, negative. Bang, bang. Don't bow down to them. So that'll be one and two or just one. All right, so let's go with this one. So, so far, we got two negative commandments. I'm just looking at it like Ten Commandments. All right. Well, you know what? Let me just do it in our perspective. So this is all one commandment, all right, before they split it up into two. Don't have no other guys. Don't bow down to them. Don't serve them. All this is one command. So this one is a negative command. Okay. Thou shalt not take Hawa's name in vain. That's another. Thou shalt not do that. So that's two negative commandments. Keep the Sabbath. That's telling you what to do. Instead of saying what not to do, it's telling you what to do. So we have two negative commandments, one positive commandment. Okay. Honor your father, your mother. That's a positive commandment. It's telling you what to do. Thou shalt not murder. So, so far as two and two, thou shalt not murder is a negative command, right? 
okay? Don't commit adultery, negative commandment. Don't steal, negative commandment. Don't bear false witness, negative commandment. So that's six negative, two positive. Now you see why there's more negative than positive over there. Six negative, two positive. Thou shalt not covet, seven negative. Second, seven, eight, okay, yeah, seven and two. So out of those nine commandments, <laughs> even if you look at it as 10 commandments, then you have eight, eight, uh, negative two, positive. But when you look at it with the nine, you have a seven and two ratio. So something I haven't done, figure we do it together for the first time. So again, that's why you have much more negative commandments than positive commandments because in the script it's at a seven and two ratio All right. and we left off at that throwing the stones and from there we went into you know we we got our merc merc retro's ass right you know i mean we, we got back into that throwing the stones moab Amon, the uh mars and saturn hodge and all that stuff So this was the negative commandment number six. The sixth prohibition is that we are forbidden from serving an idol even in a manner other than one of the four types of service which we have mentioned. This is upon condition that it is served Kadarka. Kadarka means the normal way or natural way in the way this idol is customarily served, such as excreting to the idol or Throwing a stone at Merculus. And he said, oh, Merculus, like, miracle is like Wednesday, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you see this stuff in the cartoons. And <laughs> it just got me thinking about Prince Wednesday uh, on Daniel Tiger, you know. <laughs> there's, there's other princes, too, but the one that makes the most... Cameos is always Prince Wednesday, man. Miracle as Mercury, right? He's this prince. <laughs> Throwing a stone at Mercury, man. And we said, is this for real, for real? And we got a little deeper, man. We started digging into Sanhedrin, different things. Throwing rocks at Mercury. Said, oh, they're really doing this shit today. But they call it just throwing it, throwing stones at the devil. You know, oh, Abraham had to throw stones to get the devil away so he wouldn't have to sacrifice uh, Ishmael or Isaac, whatever they want to say. <laughs> nah, man, you're throwing stones literally at the devil because Mercury is the trickster. And within that cube, within that that Kaaba stone is a literal statue of Saturn that they recently only covered up. I mean, before it was uncovered. And then Muhammad came and said, all right, you can keep it, keep the idol, but cover that shit up, you know, with that, with one, you know, continuous cloth of Saturn. Satin, Saturn, Satan, Satan. They covered it with Satan. Then they go inside and they throw stones at another huge uh, rock, whatever, you know, super stone. And that's that's the uh, Mars stone. That's the Kamesh, Kamosh, Kamesh, Kamosh. You know what I mean? So Moab and, uh, and Ahmad and all them other cats, they, they really throw stones, man. And they're still throwing stones at Saturn and Mars today. And then they're, they're obligated to go do it. So, you know, it's interesting getting the drive from the Sefer Hamid's woe because we can get specific so we can un, uncover the layers that's happening today. Because if you're just reading this out the KJV or the, this is the JPS tonight, but either way, you're just going to get, all you're going to get about the idols, thou shalt have no other gods but me. Don't make grave, graven images, if any likeness, anything above or below or in the water. Don't bow down to them, don't serve them. But this this wouldn't break the spell as to how this is applying today unless we can break it down further into, oh, you mean throwing stones at mercury. For example, the first discussion in this peric is about the deity Marcolis, the Roman god Mercurius or Mercury. 
<laughs> so Thoth got his hands in everything, whose representation was not a formal statue in the house of worship, but a simple pile of rocks built up out in the open, the open air. In this case, even thought, even though there was no statue, nevertheless, the recognizable pile of rocks represented the, the deity. Even the method of worship was out of ordinary in so much as travelers would throw rocks on the pile and they would become part and parcel. So by adding this rock, that's your energy becoming a part of Saturn or a part of Mars. Like this is how it, this energy feeds off of this is worshipers. We're only talking about Hermes Trigamagestes, right? And say, yeah, it's happening today. Who's throwing stones today? Who's throwing stones? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're talking about the Kaaba stone, the Muslim tradition, Kaaba, the two sons of Lot, Amman and Moab, honored his stone, and the two idols were brought here by them, one made of white stone, the other black stone. The name of the one that was the black stone was Mercury. Mercury Lucius, <laughs> the Mercury, the other name is Kamos, which the Moabite god is Kamesh, Kamosh, Kamesh. So it's still their gods, which is still their Mars, right? The one which was of Blackstone was erected in honor of Saturn, the white one in honor of Mars. And we said, are they still doing this shit today? Yeah, so this is the white stone. Right. The white stone, the white stone, the white stone. They roll up on this white stone. They start throwing stones into this pit, gathering, you know, the energy, devoting their energy to Mars. He's chucking the shit out this stone. He's about to throw the shit out that stone. You know what I'm saying? Then you got the black stone, which literally has a statue of Saturn in one of these corners. And they're gathering around, kissing it, hugging it, and throwing stones, just like it says the pagans have always done. Today. Today. And our brothers say, oh, man, you know, we're going to make our trip to Hajj. Our sisters say, we're going to do our Hajj, you know, get purified. They do all that purification. You do all that fasting just to go throw stones at Mars and Saturn. Ain't that some shit? Abomination. And I'm not mad at the people. This is not an attack on nobody. I'm just saying... If you're Israel, I'm speaking to Israel. If you're Israel, come up out of this bullshit. Come about this bullshit. Because we need you, brother. We need you, sister. Now let's go, man. Let's pick it up. I mean, you do still got the fire burning, don't you? Okay, okay, okay. Still got the fire burning. Let's go. So let's, uh, since we're in the negatives, let's keep in the negatives. Let's do five negatives, five positives for the dismount and just keep having a great, you know, a great march to victory. Because like Natural said, we already won. We already won. Allow, wow. Peace and Power to the tribe, to the eat the squad, to all the dragons on the wall, man. Keeping the flow flowing over here at 432. And you're witnessing uh, that fire burning within the tribe all across the plane, man. We all feel it. It's enjoyable. And ain't it dope to have something, man, to focus on, you know what I mean? To enjoy. To bring us closer to Hawaii, to see Clint. The 10th prohibition. Actually, let's go 11 because we did 10 last time. Make sure you get uh, parts one and two. I'll link them below. The 11th prohibition is that we are forbidden 
from making a monument for people to gather around and honor. Okay. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Yep. Yep, yep. Okay. Okay. And even if you ain't Israel, man, uh, you, you're going to have to get down and lay down anyway, man. So, you, for real, for real, you know, man to man, you know, real talk, you might need to stay your ass away from Mercury, you know what I'm saying? And relearn and empty your cup. It might be beneficial. I'm just saying. It ain't over for you yet. It ain't over for you yet. Hijack City, it ain't over for you yet. Trust me, man. Just leave Mercury, you know, alone, man. Hey, you know, stop throwing stones, man. All right, let's go. We are forbidden from making a monument for people to gather around and honor. When you go to churches, you see that big old statues of Jesus, Jesus. Even if it was made for serving Hawa. The reason for this prohibition is so that our service of Hawa exalted be he should be should not resemble that of idolatry. <laughs> so we don't even want to be mixed up with this stuff. Since they would build monuments and place idols upon them. When you put that Christmas tree up in your house, you start idolizing that Christmas tree. Oh, look how beautiful it is. The lights. Think about the light bill, how it go up. Think about all the energy, the money you're paying for the sacrifices, for the for the you know, presence under the tree. All, them sac all that money is energy. Currency that you're spending is energy. The um, energy of going shopping, you know what I'm saying? All the energy your children are going crazy about, you know what I'm saying? All the aroma, all the energy on that day, all that energy is going directly to Mercutus. Remember, Mercutus is Apollo, sun god, Zeus, son of Zeus. Mercury. The source of this commandment is Hawa's statement, exalted be he, do not erect a sacred pillar or a Christmas tree, Jeremiah 10. Since this is something that Hawa, your power hates, one who transgresses this prohibition is punished by lashes. <laughs> Next one up. Kneeling stones. The 12th prohibition is that we are forbidden from making stones which are prepared to bow down upon. Even if this bowing down is to Hawa, exalted be he, the reason for this prohibition is also not to resemble that of idolatry since they would place stones decorated by expert craftsmen in front of the idols and bow down upon them to that idol. The source of this commandment is Hawa's statement, exalted be he, do not place a designed stone in your land so that you may prostrate yourself on it. Now he's saying the source of this is Hawa's statement, do not place a designed stone in your land so you may prostrate yourself on it. And every single one of these Commandments, he says, this is the source, the creator. This is the source, the creator says. And I'm asking you, where where do you find it? You know what I'm saying? All this in script. I mean, someone's like, you know, we got specific, you know, laws and all that stuff. But it's so much when it comes to these commandments that he's resourcing and referencing the source of this commandment. It's Hawaii's statement. Exalted be he, do not place a designed stone in your land so you can prostrate yourself on it. 
But if you're just reading Exodus 20 and saying these are the Ten Commandments, <laughs> you ain't talking about designing stones and throwing stones at Mercury. You're not making it specific for the tribe to grow. So do you think that Moses came down off that mountain with something non-specific or something extremely specific? And when did this occur? 770 with a nine Ben David. 1168 with Moses' mama need is. Remember. Moses Maimonides' introduction to Sefer HaMenswell Book of Commandments, he states the goal he said to accomplish with authoring this work. So you get into the 613 precept. Maimonides, Maimonides prefaces his Sefer HaMenswell with 14 guiding principles that allow us to determine which Torah precepts are included in the count and which are not. He then references these principles throughout the work and thus arrives at precisely 248 positive commandments, 365 negative commandments. Now this one doesn't go into the year they say Maimonides. We have genealogy here. It's genie.com. Genie Is a rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, son of Maimon. So this is the same Maimonides, circa 1138. They said he wrote the code, what, when he was 30? So it was 1168 when he wrote, when he wrote the, you know, Sefer Hamid's Woe, Book of Commandments. The question is, if Moses Maimonides wrote the code, and 1168, 1100s, 12th century, then why or why? Hijack uh, City, Hijack City, Hijack City. If Moses Mama Needs wrote the code in 1168, They really hijacking us, man, because they don't want us to get this. They don't want us to get this work, man. There we go. Now I can click on that. Uh, Dawi. What's that? What's David doing? What's this Exilarch doing? This Babylonian exile doing? What's David doing in 1170? Anam and David, who wrote the definitive code of his order. The Sefer Hamid's World well, Book of Precepts, Book of Commandments. The same book. Now, this ain't play play. This should at least get your noodle cooking because in 7770, Anam and David wrote the code, the definitive code. The Sefer Hamid's World well, in 770, people. Then what are we talking about here? What's, what's my mind talking about? Is David Moshe? Is this also a non Ben David? Because apparently they say this Mamanita is Moses, son of my mind, or Rambam, wrote the code. But he's living over here in 1138. Now watch this. I 
Anan Ben David, founder of Anaim, Karyat, Karyas, and Kara, Kara Katai, Kara Katai. That got me thinking about the word Cherokee, you know. You know how they spell Cherokee. Well, you know how to spell Cherokee. But instead of that CH, just put a K right there. Because that's the sound it would make. Because we don't say ch ch ch, right? So that's not just Cherokee. Say it with me. Kara, 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 Kai. Cherokee is Kara, Kai. Kara, Kai. It wouldn't be a Cherokee. It would be a Kara. Chera, Cherokee. Kara, 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 Ka, Tai, Kara, Ka, Cherokee, Kara, Ka, Kara, Ka, Tai, Ka, Tai is Cathay, meaning a pure land. Kara, Kara, they say, means black in Turkic, black. So these black folk with a pure land, or the black folk of a pure land, or the Amaru Khans. Cherokee, they say, means we the people. What people? The pure people. The pure, melanated people. The Kara Katai of the pure land, Cathay. Where's Cathay? Where's China? Oh, Cathay, yo. Cathay is right here in North America. India Superior. China. Right next to Mexico. Right next to Florida. China's here, Cathay's here. This is India Superior, my naga. You are already home. And I'm just saying, who wrote the code? Because Anab and David wrote the code. He lived 715. And it said over here that Anab and David wrote the code <laughs> in 770. This is why the Preston John series is so important because we already been digging on this. Now we can, you know what I'm saying, use what we've learned throughout this Preston John series investigation as we've been Hosea 3 and 5 in it up, you know, seeking Hawa and Dawi because that led us a long time ago to Anam and David. Shout out to the Templar. Yeah. Now they call it Kara-ism. Dodge the isms. We're talking about the Karites, Karakatais, like the Carolinas, North Carolina, South Carolina. Kara. Who was leading the Kara? Wong Khan. Wong means what? King. Khan means what? Priest. Wong Khan. Priest King. Let's go. Wong Khan, Preston John, is leading the Karians. Anam and David. What's Anam got to do with Anion, the Anion King? What's it got to do with, you know what I'm saying, the uh, Mar Anon, Mar Anon, the Amazon River? What's it got to do with the Straits of Ania? Ain't we been digging on it? So now we can, you know, put all this energy directly back into the code, man. Because you can't talk Dawi without talking the code. This is why Dawi is anointed. Anointed king. And we're coming in high with Preston John. Number 50. Right now we're just digging on the code. The definitive code. We're just talking about the code. Getting on code. A out to the Templar. Talking about the law, right? And we're seeing the glitch in the matrix right in front of our face. Relating to the Babylonian exilarchs. When or oh, when was this Babylonian exile? When did Judah and, and all these, you know, tribes get led out by Shalemanazar or Genghis Khan? Did it have anything to do with the invasion of Preston John in 1202 by Genghis Khan? And would that be happening in 700s? Or is this just a hint that is really going down, is really popping off under the name Rabbi Moshe? <laughs> and the real timeline 
is right here in the 1100s. And what's Anatoly Fermenko say that this Mashiach was born around 1152? You know, he went with 1052 or 1152, and some say 1252, however those go. But this is right in the ballpark when we talk who is Preston John. Now we know we're just talking Wong Kong, we're just talking Priest King, we're just talking Hamashiach, High Messenger of the Creator, High Dragon of the, of the Creator. So there really is no birthday to those this particular type of power and energy. But, you know, if you want to put a date on it, it's bringing us right into the 12th century. Just like Templar just dropped in the ether, man. Get in the ether every Tuesday, 7 o'clock Pacific for Templar up. Templar up. Templar up. Because he just was dropping this. Bringing us back to the Anatoly for the Manco True Chronology, which we got to get that series sparking up again. That all the real history, all the real drop, all the real drop is going down. After the 900s, according to, you know, the drop that we got on that. So we got to start getting back in our chronology, staying focused with it because we see the, the hijack crumbling. Because we see the same Sephiroth Hamid's woe popping off all in the same time, man. By two of the same people. By two of the same people. Who is a not Ben David. Even in the genealogy. The genie, <laughs> the Jin Jin. Now you can look at you can look for him under Anamin David, or you can look for the same person under David Sausland. And that might be it right there, you know what I mean? Right in our Facebook. And that'll take you to the Georgian kingdoms and whatnot. Come on, man, they play. So now I'm in David, the Anion, Ania, all right, son of Yahudi, son of Yahudi, son of Yahudi, son of who? Judah. Huh? Ain't David son of Judah? It don't have to be. You know, I mean, it could be, you know, looked at two different ways. Son of Judah, like that's the relative, or son of Judah, like he's literally the son of Judah, or a Judah. Exilar. All right. Now, he had a couple children named Saul. So here's a David and a Saul situation. Oh, man, I mean, there's some waves to surf. You can look at him that way. Go right back into this duplication situation. When you look up uh, David Sostland, let me see if we can look that up. It's over here. Funny stuff. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. You can't stop us now. It's getting too good. It's getting too good to us drop the nation. It's getting too good because we're about to be back. In the Preston John series, man, it's getting too good. I mean, how will we know to connect Anam and David with David Sausland, Exilar, Babylon, and Georgia? The Brogantonis, oh, don't do that. Don't you dare say we can't dig on this drop. <laughs> Yeah. Why do we need orientation? You need to know something about your kingdom, right? Exilar David Sauston of Babylon in Georgia, son of Raja here, Raja Chola. Love to yourself, man, keeping it alive. We're coming right at him, man, in the Cholas, the Panians. Oh, man, it goes deep. It goes deep, man. But look at the date, right? So now we're over here. Late 1300s, you know what I mean? Now he's the son of Raja here, Raja. And then something around here, some, something around here brings this David right to life. And we say, who is Preston John? 
So David Slauson, the one that we were just digging on, would be his son. This is the son of this, they say, Judah or this David. David of Judah. We're going to dig on these panties, man, and these cholas. <laughs> but right now, you need to know you're talking about the empire of Sole, like Soleiman. Presta John, Jadaran, the Panion. <laughs> I can't make this shit up. So now we're getting closer to that 1100 mark. So he's popping off the same time as his mama Nita, as we saying, who wrote the code in 1168, estimated before 1195. So that's all we got. 1195 is not the date. They're just saying it's before 1195. What's this got to do with Moses Mamanitha's writing the code in 1168? And what does this David have to do with this David? Who wrote the same dang code? <laughs> wrote the definitive code, the Sefer Hamid's Wall, Book of Precepts. Which David? Which Moshe? And that brought us right here. Negative commandment number 12. So don't bow down on these uh on these stones, man. Forbidden from making stones prepared to bow down on, on these kneeling stones. One who transgresses this pro. Prohibition is punished by lashes in the words of the Sifra. The phrase, do not place a design stone in your land, teaches that only in the rest of your land may you not bow down upon stone, but you may bow down upon stones in the holy temple. Amen. Dodge all hijacks. The details of the mitzvah have been explained in the Talmudic tractic Megillah. So we're getting a translation of the Sefer Hamas. Well, we're not getting a pure water edition of a non-Ben David Sefer Hamas. Well, you know what I mean? And next time I actually want to look up and try to, because we know that the edition we're reading there, they're related directly to Mamanides, right? To Moshe. I haven't seen another translation that was dedicated directly to a non-Ben David. But let's see if we can see something pop up. everything in there. I mean, come on, man. You know, I'm going to dig, I'm going to dig, I'm going to dig some more on this, man. I'm just pulling up some stuff, man. So we're just talking about them car yet, right? <laughs> oh, Judaism? Nah, man, we're talking about the car of Qatar. You're talking about Wong Kong, Press the John. We're talking about the car of Katai. Long Khan. Press the job. It's not hard to put this together. The car of Katai, the Gurkhan and the car of Katai. Press the job. I'm just, you know, hey man. <laughs> Hey, man, the Kara Katan, right? They say Karaism now, right? The kingdom of Preston John, you're talking about the Kara Katan. Or Wang Khan, right? Wang means king. Wang like Juan, like Juanito. Like Juan, right? Juan is king. Khan is priest, priest, king. This is the ruler of the Katai. The Katai is... Kateo, switch to C and a K. Kate is Kata is Kate or a pure land right here in the four corners of America. I can't make this shit up. The kingdom of Preston John, the Kata, the Kara Kata, the Katan. We're talking about the Khans, the Mongols. The Mongols are Israel dis disguised in history. That's something else. 
someone else. But you're just talking about the Russians, the Rus, like Russia, the Picts. You're talking about Kangas Khan, who they say was President John or King David. After he invaded him, he stole the title of Dawi. He stole the title of the Preston. He became Preston John after 1202. Let's go. We just served in the way. Kara is Kara is they say. And I'm in David, founder of the Kari. Kara Katai, Wang Khan, founder of the Ananites. Bidden to go outside of one's dwelling on the Shabbat already. Already. There we go. Anon Ben David. Sefer Hamid's Woe, well, the Book of Priests, has published around 770. He adopted many principles and opinions of other anti rabbinic forms, anti rabbinic forms of Judaism. So he was going against. A certain hijack of what they were calling Judaism, rabbinic, anti these these so called rabbis that had previously existed. It had been suggested that he took much from the old Sadducees and Essenes, whose writings, or at least writings ascribed to them, were still in circulation. Thus, for example, these older sects prohibited the burning of any lights and the leaving of one's dwelling on the Shabbat. And they also enjoy the actual observations of the new moon for the appointed of fest, fest, festivals and the holding of the Pentecost festival always on the Sunday. So, again, dodge all whatever hijacks they putting on David because they want to, you know, syncretize everything about your story. Exilarch of Babylon. Now look, Anon means cloud. Did y'all know this? Remember we dug on the clouds and we got like this, you know, crazy definition of just this body of, of, of energy or translucent body of energy. What was this cloud got to do with the track? The original Anon was one of the Israelites who sealed the covenant after the return from Babylon. The original Anon sealed the covenant during Babylonian captivity, man. And he wrote the code, huh? And David wrote the Sefer Hamid's whole book of precepts. Ain't that so? So it was written in the 770 or 1168. And we got to get back into Nehemiah because this seems to be where it's all going down. And this might be very recent history, as as more as recent as the 12, 1200s, 1100s. Let's go. Who wrote the code? And I'm going to look uh, a little further, you know what I mean, when I can, to try to find some more drop on this uh, Anabin David version. Since it's being confirmed that he also wrote the Sefer Hamid as well. <laughs> it's also a non Ben David's, it's also Moses's. It's David's and Moses's, right? <laughs> now, is there any copy of this thing? It takes you right to Moses' Mama Nita. You want a copy, you got to dig on Moshe, huh? So we got to dig around, man. Y'all let me know if you come up with it, if you can get a specific copy that was, you know, they say dedicated from Dawi. Right now we're digging on the one from Moshe. Let's go. Because I would love to compare this one and I'm in David's, although we know we're talking the same person. Let's go. Negative commandment number 13.
The 13th prohibition is that we are forbidden from planting trees in the holy temple or next to the altar for decoration or beauty, even if the intent the intention is to serve for what? This is because they would also honor idols in this way, i.e. planting beautiful, pleasant looking trees in their houses of worship. Oh man. I ain't never seen it before. <laughs> Christmas time, huh? You got to plant you a pleasant looking tree in your house. Oh, man. Houses of worship. Then we talk about the Asherah pole. Asherah, Asherah pole. This is everything to do with your Christmas tree, man. Damn, ain't that some shit? Ain't that some shit? How would you get this if you were just reading what they give you as the Ten Commandments. Unless you went further, started digging on who wrote the code, <laughs> started digging on this David Soslin, started digging on this Anonymous David who wrote the code, just like Moshe. Just like Moshe. And now we got this drop to back up Jeremiah 10. This is because they would honor idols in this way by planting beautiful, pleasant looking trees in their houses of worship. The source of this commandment is a statement. Do not plant for yourself an Asherah or any other tree near your altar, near the altar of Hawa, your power. One who transgresses this prohibition is punished by lashes. Hey, man, it's a lot of people that need to ask what, man. I'll tell you that much. The details of this mitzvah have been explained in the Talmud attracted Tamid. There it is explaining, explained that this planting is prohibited in the entire temple. So why would you do it in your house? Let go. Swearing in the name of false gods. Let's go. The 14th prohibition is that we're forbidden from swearing in the name of an idol. Remember, the commandment is not to not swear by the name of your creator. It's to not swear falsely by the name of your creator. I'm trying to get a specific translation here. Uh, here it says, instead of do not take your creator's name in vain, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of your creator. We're talking about not swearing falsely by Hawa's name. Many people are familiar with the Ten Commandments. However, if I told you that much of them that you... If you were taught is wrong, I will go ahead and tackle this one. Exodus 20 and 7 says, Do not take the name of Hawa or in vain, for Hawa will leave, will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. What does that mean? The usual interpretation of this verse is that we are not to use Hawa dodge to hijack. As if it was a curse word or profanity, certain certainly that would that could very well be a valid interpretation. But it does not touch all, does not at all touch the main point of this command. I found an interesting, an interesting Jewish translation and commentary 
regarding this vo this verse. And it says, do not swear falsely by the name of the creator. This commandment is to never take the name of Hawaii in vain, pointless or insecure oath. Don't make a pointless or insecure oath. You see how translations can get us crossed up? Because in this, even in this JPS Tanakh 1917, it says, Thou shalt not take Hawa's name in vain. Don't take his name in vain. But what does it mean? Who's, who's explaining this stuff to us? We're digging on it with a dragonfly perspective. We're going back to the base, home base, you know what I'm saying? Do not swear falsely by the name of Hawa. So, Swearing is one thing. How do you swear? By making an oath. But don't make a pointless oath or an insecure oath. It's not, oh, don't use Christians. We're, we're taught in the vein of Christianity, the vein of Christianity. Don't take God's name in vain means don't use the name God in vain. Oh, don't say, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, you're saying the wise, you're saying the creator's name in vain. Don't don't use God's name in vain. Oh my God, you goddamn fool! Oh, you're using the Creator's name in vain. You're using God's name in vain. That has nothing to do with making a pointless or insecure oath. Because God ain't the Creator's name. I'm gonna fall back and have my tea. It's been cold and rainy. You know what I mean? I've been getting my herbals up, love to <laughs> to Coom say. I need to lie down. I ain't slept in like four days, dropping all that flat drop. But I know you needed it, and I, and we needed it. We needed to eat the rub so that we can see clearly, love to Sister Sonia, that there are worlds beyond the poles. A whole nother world. How does this adjust your perspective? Let's go. So do not swear falsely. So don't make a false oath with the creator. Don't say, oh, the creator promised, you know, me this. And therefore, yada, yada, yada. Or the creator said that we need to throw stones because yada, yada. You know what I mean? You know, however it goes, man. I'm sure there's a lot of ways, <laughs> a lot of ways to, uh, you know, break that down. In English, language swearing eventually became equated with cussing or using profanity, but the main meaning has to do with falsely swearing to do something in Hawa's name. We're going to do this in the Creator's name because the Creator loves me and told me that this is what we need to do. And now you see how that can mislead the people. If we don't go through Christ, we'll never know the Creator. If you don't go through Christ, you'll never know the Creator. You see how you're swearing falsely? In the name of Hawa. Come out of her. And let's get this PDF of the Sefer Hobbit's Woe, Anam and David style. We got a couple more to get. And the negative commandments. So the 14th, 14th prohibition is that we are forbidden from swearing in the name of an idol, even when dealing with idol worshipers. So too, may, we may not cause them to swear in the name of an idol, as our sages explained in their statement. One may not cause a non-Jew to swear in the name of his idol. Hmm. So they're not supposed to be able to cause, you know, uh, a non-Jew to swear in the name of his idol. One may not cause a non-Jew to swear in the name of his idol. All right, let's go. The source of this commandment is a wild statement, exalted to be he, do not mention the name of other gods, i.e., by having a non-Jew swear in the name of his idol. Our sages also explain here, this verse, do not mention, teaches that one may not utter a vow in the name of an idol. <laughs> Don't utter a vow in the name of an idol. So it's not just, oh, don't mention Mercury. It's like, no, nah, don't put no vow in the name of none of this Merculus or Moloch or none of this crap. Oh, in the name of, you know what I'm saying? You know, Christians do it every day, right? In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. 
in Yahweh and in the name of Yahweh Shah, Yahweh Shah, Yahweh Shah. I got to give acknowledgement to this Yahweh Shah because you believe the story, you believe the hype. It's the same story when you're talking Jesus or Yahweh Shah. It's the same hijack. It's the same spellbinding construction that was put to put us in a brand new, they call excellent new tomb. Like the selling of Joseph in the 1700s. Love to let us find the truth for that, man. The selling of Joseph breaks down the ancient love song versus the excellent new tomb. And that this story that was put on us has everything to do with hijacking us and giving us an idol that represents us. That idol of Jesus Christ on the cross, black Jesus on the cross, represents the struggle of the indigenous black man, black woman right here. And they made that idol to represent your crucifixion and to inception you in your in the deepest depths of your heart bone. So you look at it and you love it because it has such deep meaning and you don't even know it. It's sorcery. It's tapping into all the pain. That idol, that symbol is tapping into all the pain of the struggle of the crucifying of the Naga. Was he hung on a tree or on a cross? Because it sure does say hung on a tree in the book of Acts. And I think that represents you being hung on many trees by Naga. And it's tapping into your subconscious pain and connection and heart. And that's why our brothers get trapped no matter what, how, no matter how much drop they got. That Mercury is real over there. Son of Zeus is son of Zeus. Mercury, son of Zeus, is Zeus. Saturn, Jupiter, same family, same hijack. Come out of her, Babylon. Do not mention teachers that one person may not tell another. Wait for me next to such and such an idol. One who transgresses the prohibition by swearing in a re reverential manner. Reverential, like you're revering it. By any created being which people mistakenly believe in as a God. Like who? Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. That's what they say. Trust me, man. I got I got that in my family. And guess what I get back? Oh, uh, you know, it's not like it's not an idol. Jesus is God. He's he's man in the flesh. So is Mercury. So is Mercury. That's false. No man died for you. You died for you. And you continue to die for you. Every day you ain't on your land, you die for you. Will you live for your creator or die for yourself? Choose up. Stop throwing stones. Do not utter any vow in the name of an idol. Oh, in the name of Yahweh Shai, no. Oh, in the name of Jesus, no. None of that. One who transgresses this prohibition by swearing in a reverential manner by any created being, which people mistake as God, is punished with lashes. A whole lot of ass whooping coming up, man. There's a whole lot of lashes coming on, man. In a tractic Sanhedrin, when discussing the prohibition of hugging an idol, kissing it, sweeping the floor before it, or showing any signs of respect or love, or our sages said, one is not punished by lashes, Unless others, unless others a vow or an oath in its name. The details of this mitzvah have been explained in the seventh chapter of the Sanhedrin. Let's get negative commandment number 15, and then we're going to get our five positive commandments for the dismount. The 15 prohibition is that we are forbidden from leading people to idolatry. Or oh, you got to know Christ to know the career. Leading people to idolatry by speaking to them and encouraging them to serve an idol. Even if the person himself did not serve the idol or do anything other than lead others to it. If he misleads the many people, he is called a madiak. The source of this prohibition is a wise statement. Exalted be he. Wicked men among you have led the city's inhabitants astray, saying, let us go and serve false gods. If he leads an individual person astray, then he is termed a messis. The source of 
the source being Hawa's statement, exalted be he. If your maternal brother tries to lead you astray, secretly saying, let us go and serve false gods. But this prohibition, we are speaking ex exclusively about the Madiak, 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 Madiak. If he misleads the people, he is a Madiak. You know, Ak is your brother, right? So Madi must be like a shitty ass brother, you know, an evil brother. You know what I mean? We got some mighty ox. We got some mighty ox around here. But in this prohibition, we are speaking exclusively of the mighty ox. And the source of this commandment is a wise statement. Exalted be he. You may not mention the name of, of false gods. You must not let it be heard through your mouth. Our sages said, in tractate Sanhedrin, the verse, you must not let it be heard through your mouth, is the prohibition of Mises, Mises, M-E-I-S-I-S. But the prohibition of Mises is already written explicitly. If your maternal brother tries to lead you astray, secretly saying, let us go and serve false gods, you shall put him to death. And they will no longer do this wicked act in your midst. Rather, the verse, you must not let it be heard through your mouth, is the prohibition of Madiah and Makilta of Rabbi Ishmael. Similarly says, the verse, you must not let it be heard through your mouth, is the prohibition of Madiah. One who transgresses this prohibition is punished to death by stoning. In the words of the tractate Sanhedrin, those who lead a city to idolatry are punished by stoning. You want to throw stones? You really want to play that game, the stoning game? The details of this mitzvah have been explained in the 10th chapter of Sanhedrin. And maybe, I mean, why stoning, right? Because they were throwing stones. So he said, all right, so since you're throwing stones, you're going to get stoned. <laughs> makes sense to me. Gives me a whole new outlook on stoning. And, and, and why, why the punishment was stoning. We're just talking about throwing stones at Merculus, Saturn, and Mars. So those are five negative commandments. And let's, you know, enjoy sweeping through these uh, positive commandments. We're on positive commandment number 10. Pull up the Sefer Hamid's Whoa. And let's continue. On positive commandment 11. Studying and teaching Torah. So these positive commandments are, this is what you should do. Right? The 11th mitzvah or law is that we are commanded to study and teach the wisdom of Torah. Drop nation, what it do? Shout out to the Ether Squad. This is called Tamu Torah. The source of this commandment is Hawa's statement, teach them to your children. The Sefri says, the phrase teach them to your children refers to your students. One who similarly finds all over the, that students are called children, as it is written in the children, the students of the prophets went out. Our sages also said that, said there, the word teach them signifies that they should be sharp in your mouth. That when someone asks you something, you should not stammer, but rather answer him immediately. This commandment is repeated numerous times. Learn them, do them, so that you will learn them. The commandment is stressed and encouraged in various passages spread throughout the Talmud. Women are exempt from this commandment since the verse says, teach your sons. Our sages explain this obligation applies to teaching your sons and not your daughters. And hey, we dodged the hijack. We know, sisters. We know we dodged the hijack because try telling Khalifa that. Try telling Sheba that. What did Sheba do? She went back and taught all her people, man. Don't worship the sun. Worship the creator of the sun. So we know our sisters must learn and teach teach their daughters and we teach our daughters and we teach our bonds and by and we keep the water flow <laughs> positive commandment number 12 the 
twelfth mitzvah is that we are commanded in the actions involving the tefillim worn on the head. The source of this commandment is a wise statement: "Exalted be ye, and they shall be for tatofos between your eyes." The mitzvah is repeated in Torah four times. So, worn on your head. So they're talking about that black, small leather cube containing the parchment scrolls inscribed with the shimmer. You know, again, we dodge all hijacks into how they're interpreting, you know what I'm saying? Especially putting the cube on your head. Right now, we're waking up and just going directly to the creator. You know what I mean? The creator's not coming down being upset that you don't got cubes on your head. The creator's not coming down being pissed off that you don't uh, have your beard a certain way. And that you don't have your fringes on. The creator wants to know if you're in order. Are you throwing stones? Are you worshiping false gods? Number one. Don't talk to me about beards and fringes. Don't talk to me about a cube on my head. If you're out of order. Beards, fringes, and not wearing cubes on our head did not put us in captivity. So I get it. We wake up. We want to be us. You know what I mean? We want to say, oh, we're going to do this. Look at my, look at my cube on my head. Look at my fringes. Look at my beard, man. It's just flowing, man. Remember, Santa Claus got a beard. Moabites got a beard. Esau got a beard. Well, you know, <laughs> how many hijacks got beards, man? So that's not what's going to make you stand out to the creator. It's being in order that makes you stand out to the creator. The creator ain't coming down looking for all of your indigenous tribal you know look how tribal and indian you are oh you know your you know your indian tribe wow and if that indian tribe ain't dedicated to the laws of the creator that might not be uh the flow it just might be something else to claim might be something else to make you feel fulfilled but your fulfillment comes in being in the water because drop nation got the water and that goes to all my family, man, digging on their genealogy, digging on all that stuff. I, I dig it. Get to know yourself as much as possible, but just know that the story continues. And when you get down to it, who are you? I can't just be a Cherokee, and that's what it is. The Cherokee is either going to be the sons of Jacob or they're not the sons of Jacob. And that's all good. But who are you? The Chickasaw is going to be the sons of Jacob. Maybe they're the sons of Esau. There's a lot of Esau, Chickasaw connection, right? There's a lot of Choctaw, Esau connection, huh? We're going to get on this creek and these creek wars in Tecumseh. So it's not about that. If you were Choctaw, choose up. If you sons of Esau, choose up. If you sons of Moab, choose up. I could do genealogy all day and I'll get all kind of different things, right? But at the end of the day, the creator's not looking for me to be as Esau as I can be or as Choctaw Chickasaw as I can be. He wants to know, she wants to know, are we in order? Are we putting powers before our power? Are you putting the power before your power? Idols? Are you killing each other? Are you stealing from each other? Are you worshiping? Are you bearing false witness? Are you swearing falsely in the name of Hawaii? Are you coveting your neighbor's house? Are you bearing false witness? That's what the creator's coming down in the frequency of not Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Blackfoot. You want to be a super Indian, man? Just know that super Indian belongs to the tribes of the creator that extends beyond your version of being super Indian. Worlds beyond the pole don't just have a bunch of super Indians. They're in order of their creator, their power, they're not. Get to know yourself by all means, but don't be so Indian that you separate yourself from the water. Because the creator ain't coming down looking for the Indian. He's coming down looking for the flow. Because you can be the purest Israelite and still be out the flow. You could be pure by blood connected to Judah and be a mother sucking hijack because of your choices. That ain't going to save you. Being Israel ain't going to save you. Being in the flow, being in the water is going to save you. 
Let's go. The 13 mitzvahs that we are commanded in the actions involving the Tefillin war on the R. The source of this commandment of is a wise statement. Exalted be he, and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. The mitzvah is also repeated in the Torah four times to prove that the Tefillim of the head and of the hand count as two separate mitzvahs is from the tractate Menachos. In this passage, the sages expressed surprise at the one who proposes proposed that one may not wear the tefillin of the head and the arm independently unless both of them are available so they're getting into their practices again you know this unless you are in you know what i mean you know connected to whatever culture they're trying to connect to but when you talk about wearing cubes on your head you know, what's it say the phylacteries Small leather, small black leather cubes containing the parchment scrolls, the shema that they repeat. So, and again, are they getting that from us and we just don't know it? I don't know. You know what I mean? I don't know. Did this have some relevance to us and they're just, you know, doing their own hijacked version of it? Is he coming out of nowhere with this? Again, I don't want to demonize the cube just because they're over there walking around the cube. And we connect that with Saturn and all this frequency, but remember, we're just talking platonic silence. So it's not it's not the cube that's the demon, you know. It's with the intention that they're using with their crystallized, you know, foundational Earth frequency. Because remember, the platonic solid of this hexagonal uh, cube is the Earth energy is connected to the earth and then you got the isosahedron connected to the water right and the dodecahedron you ain't supposed to mention it don't even mention the dodecahedron because that's all ether and we about to get on that dodecahedron coming up real soon we just talking platonic silence man so again you know i'm not against a a cube you know what i'm saying as long as you know it's not connected with a negative intention so, you know, I want to be open-minded as we did. Let's go. Did they, you know, snatch our stuff at some point? You know, what is it? Of course they did, right? The meaning of the statement, a person that does not have the possibility of performing two mitzvahs shouldn't perform, shouldn't perform at least one mitzvah. Certainly not. He should perform the mitzvah available to him. Therefore, Don whichever of them to fill him of the head or of the hand is available. We see this passage that Tephilim of the head and of the hand are two are called two mitzvahs. Women are not obligated in these two mitzvahs of Tephilim. This ex this exemption can be seen from Hawa's statement, exalted be he, stated stating the reason for this obligation of wearing Tephilim in order that Hawaz Torah be in your mouth and women are not obligated in Torah study. This is the Mel Kilta's explanation. All the details of these two mitzvahs have been explained in the fourth chapter of Manakos. So again, we dodged their, you know, Talmudic flow of this. I would love to see a Naaman David's pure water, you know what I mean? Sephiroth as well. We know, sisters, by the time we get this, it's been Judy. Judea eyes, just like Christian eyes, Judea eyes have been dipped in Judaism. So we got it, man. You know, dodge your own damn hijacks. Let's get two more for this mouth. Positive commandment number 14. All right, now we're talking the fringes, right? So we know that these commandments were given to Israel when? Let's go to Exodus 20.
So we got 21. 21 is continuing. You know what I mean? With the rules. Putting down the code. 22 continues. If a man steals an ox or sheep and kills it. And now we remember, you know, touching a lot of his base earlier in the Sefer Hamid's well. Try to remember which one was the friend. His friend. Okay, numbers 15, that's right. For some reason, I thought there was another one. Exodus. Let's get this one there, numbers 15. All right, so either way, you got after the Exodus. We're in numbers 15. Yeah, man, KJV, whatever, man, whatever, man. Let's go. Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of the garments throughout the generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. All right, so when are you getting this? All right, I am Hawa, your power, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So, you know, when are we getting this drop? After we were brought out of the land of Egypt. You didn't get these commandments while you were in captivity. So the point is, so why is not coming back looking for you to, you know, have it all perfect. You've been in captivity. We've been, we got brothers and sisters in jail, in and out of jail, niggas getting killed. We got all kind of stuff, all kind of brainwashed, hijacked. You know what I mean? We're completely out of our minds. Hawa gave us these fringes and, you know, all this stuff after, after the freedom. You know what I'm saying? So, and again, after this particular exodus, man, all praise to Allah, all of these specifics will be laced out again. But don't, you know, try to, you know, hold them on and, uh, uh, you know, just violate your brother's peace. You know what I'm saying? Oh, where's your fringes? You know, where's your, where's your beard, man? <laughs> where's your this, man? You're in captivity. You start to remember. You start to get in order. And the number one thing is that you focus on what puts you in captivity. And that's back to these nine commandments or this, you know, 613 flow that we're getting specifics on this idol worship. Specifics on putting another power before your power. Because none of this matters if you're putting another power before you. None of this matters if you're a hijacked city. None of this matters. Your beard don't matter. Your fringes don't matter. Your... A cube on your head don't matter. So by all means, rock your fringes. By all means, rock your beard. By all means, be as Hebrew as you can be and look as Hebrew as you can look. <laughs> but in being an Ibari, an Ibaru, one who crosses, you need to cross into that frequency, though. You need to cross over into that, into that greater light. Then you represent yourself. You know, as pure water as possible and all the particulars and physicalities and uh, all the, you know, uh, you know, what I'm saying specifics, you know, all these will be laced out after captivity like they were laced out after captivity. You know, it's repeating itself. But, you know, all praise a while we can spiral up out of this loop of captivity. Ain't you tired of captivity? How long will Hawa endure who brought you? out of bondage, already brought you out of bondage. You put yourself back in the, back in Egypt. Now you back in Egypt. Now we back in Egypt, man. To rock your fringes, I get it. To all your generations, I get it. What's it say? Throughout their generations, all right? Forever, right? How long is that forever? By all means, man. By all means, rock your tassels. Rock your blue thread. That's beautiful, man. I'm not against fringes or beards. I'm just saying, you know, this is not what Hawaii's coming back looking for. Blue threads on your tassels. 
a wise coming down with smoke out of his mouth, a nostrils fire out of his mouth, not looking for tassels and beards. You dig? He's over there ready to slay the hijack as long as you get out the way of the Merc Retro app. As long as you disconnect and move to the side, you're doing your job. As long as you're assembling, whether you're assembling in the ether or in real time, breaking away from the static, getting out the way of the static. Rule number one, don't put no power for your power. And that's our beginning right now. That's where we're at. Don't talk to me about beards and fringes. I'm just trying to unplug the people from putting a power before your power. Don't talk to me about cubes on your head and all that. Well, what about this Hebrew thing? Are you throwing stones at Mercury? Are you calling on Yahweh Shai and Jesus and Zeus and all this other bullshit? Or are you going directly to your creator, directly to your fifth and sixth letter of the Paleo Hebrew, your breath of security, your revelation of the foundation, your foundational revelation, your wah. You can't hijack the fifth and the sixth letter of the Paleo Hebrew, a wah. Before you get your Zion, before you get your seventh letter, Zion, I'm just talking Paleo Hebrew. Come back home and go direct. That's where we're at. One day we'll be at the beers and fringes stages again. One day we'll get there. And by all means, if you're already there, allow why. Just don't be backwards pimping. Don't be looking super Hebrew and still be hijacked, calling on Yahweh Shah. Let go. So let's talk, let's talk the tzitzis, let's talk the fringes. Attach a thread of blue on the fringe of every corner. Although we have basic principles, a lack of blue thread does not prevent one from fulfilling the mitzvah of white, for, or white thread. <laughs> so you might say, I ain't got no blue thread. All right, we got the white thread. <laughs> The lack of white thread does not prevent one from fulfilling the mitzvah of the blue thread. And as explained in the 11th principle, this would be sufficient indication that they are independent and count as two separate mitzvahs. Nevertheless, they are not counted as they are not counted as two mitzvahs. This is this is stated explicitly in the Sefri. One might think there are two mitzvahs, the mitzvah of blue thread and the mitzvah of white thread. However, the Torah says, and it shall be to you as tzitzis. This, this shows that it is only one mitzvah, not two. Women are exempt from this mitzvah, as explained in the beginning of the tractate, Kadushin. So you don't got to wear a beard. You don't got to wear the fringes. Although we know that our indigenous sisters always had them fringes on, man. So, I mean, come on, man. All the details of this mitzvah have been explained in the tractate Monaco. So, again, that's where it gets silly, man. Because we know our sisters got fringes. They rock the blue and the white, you know what I mean? And, oh, oh no, nah, sister, you're in violation. You can't rock a white and blue thread. Like, you know what I mean? That's when it gets silly, man. We dodge all hijacks. We just getting the drop out of this. We're not over here telling you to connect to no form of any hijack whatsoever. But we just... You know what I'm saying? As we start peeling back these layers and seeing these duplications in these Moseses, and we realize that there's a Moses that wrote the code or rewrote the code, but it's the same code that Anam and David wrote in 770. It's the same definitive code of order. The Sefer Hamas what? The Book of Precepts, the Book of Commandments. Its unifying principle is its rejection of much of the Talmud, man. So although, you know what's interesting, man, is that with the Moses Mamanidas drop, they seem to be more trying to embrace it with the Talmud a lot, right? We keep mentioning Talmud. But the unifying principle with this Anand and David drop, remember Anand means cloud, right? Cloud, like them cloud forests, like them kitsus, right? Goto, right? 
the unifying principle, it's its rejection of much of the Talmud and the rabbinate. So that, that would be like the Pharisees and, you know, all these hijacks, you know, trying to, you know, kick their version, hijack the real flow of the ancient love song, which based its authority on the Talmud. So Anam and David, man, is writing a code, Torah, against the Talmud. Against the authority of the Talmud. Rejecting the Talmud. We need to get our copy of this joint right here, man. You know, we're going to keep it going, but don't get too hijacked into none of this Judaism, uh, you know, remix of what we're reading. Just know that there is a pure water source out there and it might be closer into the Anab and David version. You know what I mean? We're going to keep on digging for it. The 15th positive commandment for the dismount. Let's get it. The 15th mitzvah is that we are commanded in the actions involving the Mazora. The source of this commandment is a wise statement. He's ought to be he and you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and open your gates. This identical commandment is repeated in Torah. All the details of this mitzvah are have been explained in the third tractate. Manakos. Mazor is what the what they put on the on the doorpost, parchment scroll affixed to the doorpost. So it's very Jewish, right? But again, where where did they get this stuff from? You know what I mean? I don't give the hijack any credit of creativity. You know what I mean? They just jack everything. So is this some of our shit, you know what I'm saying? Some of our stuff that they're jacking? Or, you know, is this completely hijacked to have the scroll or put scripture in the scroll and to put it outside your door or to roll up some scripture and put it in a little cube in your, in your, <laughs> and where, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know what I'm saying? We don't see that in, in our Torah to be wearing no cube on our head. Right. But you know, what are they connecting with it, man? And where's it going? Where's it coming from? And where, where are we going with it? That's the question, man. But, Hey, that was a uh, 15. We're on uh we we've read 15 positive commandments so far in this series. We've read 15 negative commandments so far in this series. So fo so far we've read 30 commandments. We realize that there's 613. So this is going to be a nice lengthy flow, but something that we can always come back to and just check in and just check in with the code. Check in with the code, man. And let the code connect us with the cloud. <laughs> with that Anna. That Dawi. Yeah, we gotta get the drop. Cause they want to always connect us back with mama need is Moshe. But we know there's a Dawi connection just like that there. Don't mind me, I'm just uh, doing some recon. <laughs> and what happens when we do that recon? As soon as I get specific, right? <laughs> PDF full Sefer Hotman's Woe, Mitz Woe, but now I'm in David Sefer Hotman's Woe. Our recon comes up. You know, this lets us know 
since 2016. We got recon partners to this investigation. A lot of wild. From King Drop to Con Drop, man. From my balcony surface all the way, man. All the way nine above. We gonna keep the water flowing. Oh, man. They teasing us, y'all. <laughs> they are teasing us, man. It's out there somewhere, man. I would love to compare those two, man, wouldn't you? Download here. Man, I know they're trying to trick me, huh? Should I press it? Ah, oh, no. They don't. don't hack my shit. Don't hack my shit. Don't hack my shit. Don't hack my shit. Oh, same thing, same thing. I was close. Yeah, they teasing us, man. Y'all let me know what you come up with. Y'all let me know what you come up with, man. We just keeping it to the cold. Well, we keep the water flowing. And we coming for you, Priest King, Wong Khan. We coming for you. Roger and Roger Cholas. We coming. But at the end of the day, we just talking Dawi, Babylonian exilarchs, right? But before they said 770 exilarchs, right? Now we got exilarchs popping all the way up to the 1300s, phantom and duplications. So it looks like we can get real cozy around these 1200s, 1300s, 1100s. That seems to be where all the drop is popping off at. And all the fantasies and duplicates are coming out of so-called dark ages. Dig on. All these will lead you to the same person, but told in a different way. King David, King Consort David Sauston, son of Jadaron, just like that one. Presta John. King Consort David, all right, of Alania, right, the Alans, Anians, Alans, Rusadon, Rus, Rus, husband of Queen Georgia Tamir, powerful sister right here, we know that, she she ran the kingdom when she had to, Exilar David the sixth, Slauson, is what we, the one we just dug on, the son of Raja here, Raja Jadaran, so you got Jadaran here, Jad around here, we need to know what's going on. And then it takes it to the Bragatonis, which goes right back into the kingdom of Georgia. Managas. Who wrote the code? In 770, Anab and David wrote the definitive code of his order. The Sefer Hamid's War. Book of Precepts, man. And we're just fighting to keep the fire burning. 613 or 10. 613 or 10. Dragonfly perspective. No matter what you do. No matter how you feeling. No matter what's jamming you up. My knock. Remember. At all costs, man, we got to keep the fire burning. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Right now, my fire's on that, uh, they trying to put my fire out, man. Look at them, they're trying to put my fire out. Nah. They're going to try to hijack me in three, two, one. See? They're trying to put our fire out. I mean, who plays advertisements when they know we're just trying to keep the fire burning? <laughs> we keep the fire burning. Alawa. Alawa. Alawa.
loud one. Y'all keep surfing the wave. We're going to come back with some more flat drop, man, real soon. Dig on some Operation High Jump, man, and some more specifics. Go back to that John Abazai and keep the water flowing. Shabbat up, Drop Nation.